Hello. So I'm not going to talk about what quantum computers can do. You may have read uh, articles in a newspaper, seen videos about the applications of quantum computers, breaking uncrackable codes, revolutionizing drug discovery, making our world more efficient, designing wonder materials. But that's the subject of another talk. All I'm going to say today is that the quantum computer is the most powerful computer that we can conceive of building based on the laws of physics as we know them today. And it's that that drives many people, including myself, to try to build one. What I'm going to talk about today is how do you build a quantum computer? What is a quantum computer going to be made of? And how is that going to affect its ultimate capabilities? First of all, let's think about conventional computer, like the mundane machine which is running uh, this presentation. This uh, computer is restricted to processing information in definite states, zeros or ones, not exotic superpositions of both at the same time. Computers like this are made out of silicon chips, integrated circuits that pack billions of silicon transistors together in order to make a, a computer processor. In fact, silicon has become synonymous with computing. We talk about Silicon Valley in the US, or more parochially in the UK, Silicon Fen and Silicon Roundabout. But silicon hasn't always been the material of choice for computers. We've used different ways to encode information over the years, and that has dramatically affected what the computer is able to do. One of the first computing devices, dating back to the Roman Empire, is the astrolabe. This wasn't a universal computer, but its mechanical design could accurately predict the motions of celestial objects. In many ways, it was an early predecessor to the smartphone, a consumer computing device. It could help a discerning and superstitious medieval user predict when would be a good day for their annual bath. And a few thousand years later, after the first astrolabe, Charles Babbage developed another type of application-specific computer based on mechanics. His design was uh, made in order to calculate uh, the values of logarithms and trig functions. And it was called the difference engine. The difference engine, the design, involved 25,000 moving parts. It would have weighed over four tons, but only a tiny fraction of it was ever built. And Babbage even went on to take the same idea to develop a universal uh, computer, a general purpose programmable computer but it was so complex, it never got off the drawing board. So we can see here this fundamental problem. Mechanical gears uh, being used to encode information was all very well if you wanted to make a small calculator, but it wasn't something that would scale in order to, in, 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 towards large computers. In order for general purpose computers to really take off, we had to wait another 100 years for the world's first electronic computer, built by Tommy Flowers, uh, working in the post office research station uh, uh, near Dollis Hill. You know, Bletchley Park gets all the credit. Let's not forget the, first com the computer was first built in this quiet north, uh, suburb of northwest London. So this uh, computer called the Colossus used 1,500 vacuum tubes, and it really set the stage for a further two decades of development of computers based on this way of encoding information in vacuum tubes or valves. But later computers did not involve many more vacuum tubes. They still stayed around the same sort of number. They added memory, but there was still this fundamental problem in scaling up the technology to large numbers. So in the end, the profound revolution in computing that has really shaped our society for the last 50 years was made possible by encoding the information within the states of silicon transistors. The silicon integrated circuit went from a proof of concept demonstration in the late 1950s to the world's first commercial integrated circuit um, in uh, the early 1970s. And it completely transformed computing. It brought down the power, the size, and the footprint um, uh, uh, of, these, of these technologies. So each of these different ways of uh, building computers was the leading technology in its day. But the first two rapidly reached limits in scalability. Only the silicon transistor was able to demonstrate a million-fold increase in complexity from the, from the first microprocessors that contained thousands of transistors to processors today that have tens of billions. 
So in order to try to understand why, what's made that possible, let's look into these machines and look at the physical resource that's used to encode a piece of information. In the case of the early mechanical uh, machines, we're talking about vast Avogadro scale numbers of atoms used to encode information within gears. And then moving to vacuum tubes, we're talking about billions of electrons. But by moving to silicon transistors, we're able to set a path where the basic unit of information went from using millions of electrons to just a few thousand that are used in transistors today. Now, we can look at this in two different ways. On the one hand, using uh, of only a few thousand of a subatomic particle to, in, to store a piece of information is pretty impressive, right? It, it's, a, it's a pretty um, a, a strong harnessing of nature at a deep level. But on the other hand, it tells us that we've still got a fair way to go. Rolf Landauer famously said, information is physical. This means a couple of different things. First of all, it means that there are thermodynamic limits to the power dissipation in computers that use logic gates like NAND and NOR. The power that's dissipated by each one of those gates can be related to the change in entropy in going from two inputs to one output. But even after decades of development in computer technology, these latest computer chips that use just a few thousand electrons to store information still dissipate power, which is about a million times greater than this fundamental limit from thermodynamics. But information is physical also tells us something else. It tells us that if we change the physical uh, means in which we use to encode the information, then the nature of the information itself changes. Let's think about that for a second, because it's pretty strange. We're used to thinking about information as a really abstract idea that can be separated from whatever physical resource you use to encode it. But if we take information and we encode it in the states of physical systems, like atoms, electrons, photons, then the nature of that information fundamentally changes. It becomes inherently richer. We call this quantum information. Uh, quantum information is inherently more secure because it can't be copied. And if we can make computers that are able to process this quantum information, which is what we call quantum computers, these computers will be able to solve problems that are just beyond the capabilities of even the bigger supercomputers that we have today. So I said I would talk about how we're going to build quantum computers. And in principle, there's a plethora of options. Just like classical computers were built by uh, gears and valves and silicon transistors, um, all nature at its deepest level obeys quantum mechanics. So we can pick all manner of different quantum systems and use them um, to, uh, to uh, build a quantum computer. Now, over the past 25 years, lots of quantum physics experiments have been explored as providing a potential route to building quantum computers. And I'm going to focus here on three that have gained the most traction so far. First of all, there's an idea to use the states of low-loss superconducting circuits with carefully engineered nonlinearities in order to build quantum bits. It's also possible to use the internal states of atoms or ions that are trapped in vacuum using electromagnetic fields. And there are also people exploring the use of individual photons um, that are traveling down waveguides or through free space as a way to build a quantum computer. Each of these technologies involves cooling chips down to extremely low temperatures, just a few degrees above absolute zero, or even less, in order to achieve the desired um, performance. Superconducting circuits have been used to deliver the most complex quantum process to date, and, and trapped iron uh, qubits have shown the lowest error rates. But none of these technologies has yet demonstrated a quantum computer that can solve a useful problem better than a classical computer today. In order to solve the first useful problems, we believe we'll need a computer with about 100 quantum bits or qubits. And such chips already exist today made out of superconducting circuits. But the error rates are too high for quantum algorithms to be run. In order to build these first useful computers, we need to do two things. We need to make the algorithms more efficient so they can run before the errors take over. And we also need to improve the hardware to reduce the error rate. 
But at best, these are still going to be application-specific machines. They won't be able to solve everything. And so in order to build a universal quantum computer of the world-changing variety, we need to be able to correct errors, and that means going towards millions of qubits. Now, each of these different technologies behind me could probably, with some development, create one of these application-specific computers. But we don't yet know which, if any of these, will be capable of making a million qubit quantum computer. And this raises a really interesting question. There's no doubt that quantum computing represents a revolution in our ability to compute. And quantum information is completely different to any information that has come before. But is that necessarily going to be accompanied by another revolution in computing hardware, from gears to vacuum tubes to silicon? Or is it possible that the silicon chip that exists today can somehow evolve to become a quantum computer? Let's take a look at one of these uh, uh, billions of transistors that exist on chips today. For the past 50 or so years, the minimum feature size of uh, 15 or so years, the minimum feature size of these transistors has been less than 50 nanometers across. When the transistor is turned on, it accumulates a large pool of electrons underneath the metallic gate in the middle. So far, not very quantum. But if we cool this chip down to very low temperatures, a few degrees above absolute zero, and we care carefully turn it on, we can trap just a single electron inside the transistor. And we can load electrons onto the transistor one by one. So we already have a technology which is capable of manipulating individual electrons and moving from thousands of electrons per bit to just one. And moreover, we can access the quantum state of this electron. We can prepare it, manipulate it, and measure it in order to perform quantum algorithms. Some of early prototype quantum processors with up to six quantum bits have already been developed using silicon, and the error rates match the state of the art within superconducting qubits. Now, you're probably thinking, well, you know, this looks interesting, but you talked about some very low temperatures. The three examples that you gave before and with this silicon technology, these are computers operating uh, at a few degrees above absolute zero. Surely, it's not possible to uh, envisage such infrastructure for cooling in computing, even if it means a tremendous change in computing power. Well, to address that, let's look at a modern data center today, or at least how we imagine it. Rows and rows of racks of computers whizzing away with LEDs flashing, serving millions of users per second. That's what we imagine, but perhaps what we don't think about is all of the cooling infrastructure around that. Vast arrays of pipes pumping coolant around these processes in order to extract the huge amounts of power that they're dissipating. So cooling infrastructure is already a major part of large computers. But I can tell you're still not convinced. After all, we're, talking, we're not talking about keeping a computer chip just about room temperature. We're talking about cooling these computer chips to the temperature of deep space or less, minus 270 degrees C. Surely, that involves much more power um, than we could hope to save. In order to address this question, Let's have a look at some of the famous computer battles of history. In the first example, uh, uh, let's go back to the 18th century and, a, and, a, and the Mechanical Turk, which was a, um, a, a, a chess-playing robot which played uh, chess against some of the greatest minds of the age, um, and, uh, such as Napoleon and Benjamin Franklin, and won. Or it appeared to, but unfortunately, it was not a marvel of mechanical computing. Um, it was, in fact, a great fraud because underneath the table, there was a chess master playing. So round one goes to the human brain, uh, which is very much a room temperature device. There was a famous rematch of, uh, in chess between the human brain and the classical computer that took place in the late 1990s. Uh, this time, uh, there was no cheating, as far as we're in, uh, aware, and the computer was IBM's Deep Blue, which was able to defeat the reigning uh, world champion, uh, Kasparov. And this really was a milestone in computing, 
um, uh, for, uh, it demonstrating this, um, uh, this, this first victory in the game of chess. But the third uh, computer battle in history I want to talk about was from just three years ago. And this involved a quantum processor developed by Google called Sycamore. It was the challenger, and this time, the incumbent technology was the classical computer. It was a supercomputer, the world's greatest supercomputer at the time, also built by IBM called Summit. Now, these computers weren't playing chess, uh, but it was another toy problem, not a useful one, but a, ma a mathematical problem which was given to the quantum processor um, in order to try to solve in a time which was faster um, than could be done on Summit. And what's perhaps surprising is not that the quantum processor was able to win, but just how far the odds were stacked against it. Because uh, the Google um, Sycamore chip, the quantum processor, had just 53 quantum bits compared to hundreds of trillions of transistors within Summit. And furthermore, it was able to solve the problem about 1,000 times faster. And if we look at the power, yes, the, uh, the quantum processor had to be cooled down to low temperatures, and that took about 15 kilowatts of power. But it was competing against a supercomputer that was drawing uh, over 10 megawatts. So it was 1,000 times faster and 1,000 times less power. It therefore used a million times less energy to solve this problem. So advanced cooling, even down to very low temperatures, can still um, really transform what computers are able to do. And once we take electronics down to these extreme environments, lots of exciting things start to happen. Materials become superconducting. We can control electrons one by one. Um, the uh, sensitivity of electronic devices to control signals um, becomes even greater. Electrical noise gets smaller. And so this area of deep cryogenic electronics is a really exciting new frontier and not just for quantum computing. Now, I set out in this talk to answer the question, how will quantum computers be made? In truth, nobody really knows. The computing hardware that exists today is still in its infancy, and uh, most, if not all, of the quantum computers that are, you can access today on the cloud can be uh, easily mimicked using um, regular conventional computers. If someone were to offer you access to a 30-qubit machine at the moment, they could, in principle, be offering a modern-day version of the Mechanical Turk with a uh, laptop underneath the table pretending to be the computer. But take it to 50 qubits, and suddenly it becomes a lot harder, even with a supercomputer. And with 100 qubits, we believe we'll be able to start solving the first useful problems. But ultimately, to build that world-changing machine, we need millions of qubits. And it's a big step to go from hundreds to millions. Now, scientists hate to make predictions, um, but I'm going to make one uh, uh, today, which is that eventually the quantum computer will be made out of the same technology which has already demonstrated that million-fold increase in complexity. Quantum computers, I predict, will eventually be made out of the same type of silicon transistor technology which is used to make computers today. There may be three reasons for this. First of all, consider the maturity of the manufacturing platform. Decades in R&D, trillions of dollars of investment that have gone into developing the most advanced manufacturing technology on the planet. These silicon wafers, each containing trillions of transistors, are forged in these vast billion-dollar cathedrals of technology. If you can build a quantum computer on that platform, why would you build it any other way? Secondly, any quantum computer is going to have to be closely interfaced with digital and analog electronics in order to run it. And the best technology that we have to do that today is the silicon integrated circuit. By combining the qubits with the controllers used to run it onto the same platform, there's opportunities for unparalleled integration. And finally, there's the argument that we've seen this silicon CMOS technology overtake incumbent technologies in many different areas, not just in computing, but also in digital cameras and portable storage media. So maybe it seems obvious that it's going to happen again with, silica, with quantum computers. And finally, I'll leave you with one more thought, and which is perhaps you know, it, it is the unexpected, that perhaps in trying to develop silicon-based quantum computers and push this technology to the limits, we're going to learn about new ways to make 
silicon uh, computers, uh, silicon classical computers, by harnessing na uh, these devices at, at their deepest level. Richard Feynman uh, famously said, there's plenty of room at the bottom. Of course, he was right. But when it comes to computing with electrons in silicon transistors, we may still have a long way before we reach the bottom. Thank you. <laughs>